So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Warm welcome to the first panel of this year's Budapest Forum on Sustainable Democracy, which is titled Keeping Peace and the Future of the Transatlantic Alliance. Uh, my name is Daniel Hegedusch. I lead the Central Europe program of the German Marshall Fund of the United States. It's really an honor to be here with you. Uh, our uh, distinguished speakers were already introduced, so I just would like to make one small intervention. I would like to ask all those people who know what time it is on the eastern coast of the United States to give a big <laughs> applause to Reiko Samerkini. Thank you, Reiko. Thank you for your dedication. And thank you all for being with us today. And then, without further ado, just uh, let's start, I would say. Uh, I would like to, to kindly ask you, in order to facilitate the discussion, to keep your responses to four or five minutes, but otherwise would encourage you to reflect uh, on each other's statement, uh, statements and, uh, and open up discussion. And uh, considering the raging war on European soil, uh, I think the title of this panel should rather call for, uh, for peace building or the restoration of peace instead of keeping the obviously non-existent peace on the European continent. And against that background, I would like to ask my first question to, to Reka Semerkeni. What do you think and how do you see what are the substantial prerequisites of a stable, lasting, or it's, it's written in the title, sustainable peace in Europe? And considering Russia's aggressive behavior practically since 2008, is a stable and lasting peace imaginable at all without a military defeat of the Kremlin and domestic political change in, uh, in Russia? The floor is yours. Thank you, Daniel, and good a warm hello to everyone uh, sitting at the table. I'm very glad and honored, honored to meet my um, panel partners and speakers uh, who are all my friends. And so I'm glad to uh, see, that, see you there and I'm very uh, happy to be able to join you from, from overseas. And thank you also for the question. I think it is a very important one because you better, I mean, certainly when there is a war on your continent, it's, you better take it seriously and you better be precise about the words you use and the notions and the strategic thinking uh, that you approach this uh, challenge with. And especially uh, when it's a war of this type, which is completely one of the uh, uh, most brutal types of wars that we can see, on, uh, uh, unfortunately targeting civilian population, leveling entire cities, and using a very confrontational language uh, of a, a kind of a systemic cultural confrontation behind the, uh, as a driving force of this confrontation. So um, I think both for the manner and for the strategic goals of the war that is going on in Ukraine, we better treat it as a very serious issue. And so um, to your question, you know, what are the most um, substantial prerequisites um, for re-establishing a stable and lasting peace on the continent. I would say one of the most important uh, and first prerequisite is that strategic thinking has to come back to Europe. We have to be able to, um, to understand and see the world um, in a, in, and its strategic developments in a very clear-eyed way. So in a less poetical way, Europe really has to re relearn to think strategically, uh, not just in economic and political terms as we're used to in the European Union's framework, and not even just in defense and military terms that we're used to in the NATO framework, but in a very distinctly strategic uh, manner to approach the global developments and the developments that are um, taking place in, uh, on our own continent. Because I think this is the kind of basis to take stock of the new reality that is unfolding in front of our eyes. Um, Russia's war against Ukraine is not a minor conflict. It's not a smaller sort of skirmishes between two states. It's fundamentally challenging the entire security architecture uh, of the continent. 
and of course of the broader transatlantic uh, cooperation. So this reality will have to be kind of taken seriously and have to have consequences in a number of issues. We have talked about defense spending, how that has been changing. We have talked about the, the, uh, uh, the priorities of reprioritizing military industrial develop, uh, production in, on the continent and in, for all of our countries. Uh, we have to discuss very seriously how to reprioritize uh, the spending balances between economic, social and defense. Because, so there's a number of issues. But I think the foundation of this is that strategic thinking really has to be daily, normal, and an everyday uh, responsibility and task of every country on the European uh, continent. A second prerequisite for establishing a long and lasting peace is to refocus on the transatlantic cooperation. I think this is uh, what we have seen in many ways um, by most countries, definitely in the Central East European region, in NATO's eastern flank, if we want to uh, use this uh, uh, phrase. This is what uh, the Finnish and Swedish uh, strategic change uh, indicates. Uh, this is what we have been discussing about the repositioning of US and NATO troops in Central Eastern Europe. This is the, uh, the uh, kind of expressed in, in saying that defense spending at the level of the 2% for each uh, country's GDP is not a max, but it's a minimum requirement and a minimum necessity for the future. And so, um, but beyond all of this, I think what is very important is that what we have to understand that what lies ahead of us is not a time for, for um, allowing the luxury of a um, kind of a frog perspective, as we say in Hungarian, um, to see the world from below. Um, but we, I believe we have to understand that we're facing an era in which um, only a super strong cooperation between allies and like-minded friends can generate some kind of a meaningful uh, defense of stability and peace uh, in, uh, for our own countries and for our own continent. So um, that would be an illusion to think that any country can um, accommodate this, these fundamental changes on their own, and any country can on their own respond to these challenges that are they're coming. Um, I mean, any country can try, but I think it would be uh, very uh, clearly and in a very short term would be leading to um, uh, massive problems. So I think the um, refocusing on transatlantic cooperation is a, it is a very strong pillar that needs to be uh, uh, seen as a prerequisite for long uh, lasting peace and stability or reestablishing this peace and stability. Um, even in the European framework, I think we have to um, reshift our priorities and we have to, the same way, give an increased focus on strategic uh, elements of cooperation, keep the economic elements obviously strong and uh, foundational, but add on uh, the strategic thinking on the European side, which will enable Europe to be a real partner of the United States and to be a real uh, player in the transatlantic framework. Um, your, yeah, I think these two prerequisites are kind of the, um, the foundation for, uh, for the next decades to come. Thank you so much, Rika, and many thanks for underlining the importance of strengthening strategic thinking in Europe and the transatlantic alliance. As a strong, staunch Atlanticist, I couldn't agree more. And I wouldn't like to oversimplify my question, but would come back to the point whether a lasting peace is imaginable without Russia's military defeat, or we have to embrace practically that we will live in a world of conflict and insecurity without this in the future, just in one or two sentences. Oh, sure. I didn't want to avoid that, sorry. Um, yeah, so the... Um it's a very difficult position that Russia has maneuvered itself into. And it's um, unfortunate as well, I think, for many, uh, from many points of view, for Russia itself in the first place. But it's also difficult because of, um, of its impact for a very foundational principle that we used to have before, which was in, in international relations, which was the strategy of engagement on the basis of which we believe that through cooperation, through strengthening political and economic ties, uh, there is a kind of an incremental uh, positive change of, of uh, increasing the uh, commonality of values as well. 
And that was pr primarily defined, defining uh, German um, foreign policies, but also I think in many ways the U.S. was kind of on this uh, path for a long time. Um, and what we have seen uh, over the last one and a half years is a total failure of this, this strategy. It may be that you know it has been conducted in a wrong footage. It may have been that it has not been given all the resources that would have been necessary for this. But ultimately, uh, this strategy, the way we have been practicing it for practically, I think, three decades since 1990, the end of the Cold War, has become a failure. So yes, what is what is the uh, the, the way ahead uh, for Russia? I think the um, uh, we it would be very important to understand the real rationale of the war. And I would doubt that it's, you know, anything of what we have heard so far about, you know, um, uh, in many ways. But I think it's a lot of it is linked to Russia's seeing itself, uh, positioning itself for the 21st century, positioning itself for a future cooperation with China. And I think that is a very important driving force behind the, uh, the decision. But what is happening is the very opposite of what was expected. And in many ways, the, uh, the positions or the possibility uh, for uh, the original kind of strategy to unfold are diminishing uh, if, if are still there. So I think the, um, um, the, the, the situation where, where we find the, uh, um, ourselves facing Russia is very precarious and very, very sensitive. On one hand, it is clear that um, because Russia has uh, not been respecting most of the international agreements that it has signed, it's very difficult to expect any agreement in the future that would be respected or would be kind of, uh, you know, would be having any uh, credibility for the other partners. Uh, on the other hand, any change inside Russia is dependent on the Russian people itself. So I think there's way um, too much at stake uh, to anyone uh, to sort of give, you know, far reaching uh, um, predictions. It is very clear that the cracks in the uh, in this in the system that was built up by Russia after 1990, after the end of the Cold War and after the, the uh, um, uh, collapse of the Soviet um, system is, you know, it's cracking. It's like, it's, it is, there are very deep uh, divisions, there are very deep tensions that are coming to the surface uh, around Russia. And also, we can assume, we cannot assume that this war leaves the internal dynamics of Russia untouched. So that is very clear uh, and very visible, I would say, or very predictable that these um, will have an impact on Russia's internal stability. And I think the best that um, we can do is to develop multiple scenarios. Uh, there's not one scenario. Um, there are any multiple scenarios, then multiple steps of the, of the multiple scenarios, because any anything that will uh, happen will be a short, uh, I think will have a short lifespan and that another change will come again. So I think, uh, that will be a very unstable and very quickly changing environment. But what is clear, I believe, is that the um, uh, situation, I think, from uh, seen from Ukraine's um, perspective, um, I think we can say that strategically, this war has been won already. Uh, in many ways, Ukraine has maintained its strategic uh, presence, its sovereignty. Uh, Kiev is in charge of the country. Uh, it has um, uh, not only Kiev has not been taken, but it has maintained access to uh, the Black Sea and Odessa, and is not even under challenge uh, now. Uh, now they have to find a way to stop the fighting. Um, once I believe this war is strategically um, clear. And over, so I believe that the uh, this push, you know, what will give the push to Russia to sit down to the negotiating table, um, is kind of the key question of the uh, of the couple, next couple of months. And I think the the key element for this is is to give Ukraine the ability to deny further success to Russia, which means that um, they have to be able to um, understand that 
there is much better, no more to gain. And there's much better uh, positions that can be worked out through negotiations. Um, other than this, I think the internal challenges and the internal changes in Russia will come by themselves. I don't think there, um, there is much uh, that anybody can do about it. This is a situation into which Russia maneuvered itself. What is very important is that um, because it's a nuclear state and because there is a, um, a instability um, easily popping up from the inside uh, of the political leadership, um, we have to be aware of this element and we have to be sort of engaged in that uh, level. So, but I believe that this is the moment in which um, the um, further destabilizing forces can be expected both inside Russia and around Russia. Uh, it will have an impact on um, political developments um, and the, these political developments will be leading us into a long period of instability. It's not like we can expect, uh, even if you know there are, there are analyses about you know the post-Putin Russia. It's not that we can expect a, a a leader to come up and take control and just take over and and carry on as usual. Okay. I think it will be a very very long period. So um, yes, that will be a factor in uh, in uh, redefining or rebalancing uh, uh, the stability of the European continent for a long time, Thank which you. just means that. The position of Ukraine and relations with Ukraine will be um, strategically important for Europe. Thank you so much, Rika, for your insightful thoughts. Uh, Jeff, uh, following US politics and the internal division of the GOP on the issue of, uh, of the Ukraine aid, I think, uh, I think observers can easily get the impression that Ukraine is not only fighting Russia's war of aggression, but is also racing against the clock uh, in light of the upcoming uh, U.S. elections. My first question is whether you share this perception. And my second question would be how can, how should Ukraine and especially European NATO partners prepare uh, for any potential election outcome? And, and how, how would a second Trump administration impact the support for Ukraine on, on the U.S. part and the further course of the war? You have the floor. Daniel, thank you, and, and good morning, everybody, and good morning, dear Reka, in Washington, D.C., in the middle of the night. Um, the, the first thing I'd say, Daniel, is um, I, as an American living right now, in any case in Europe, often get the impression th that uh, you Europeans uh, see yourselves as bystanders, uh, passively watching what's next and how to react to what happens in the United States. I understand that the United States is a large power and so forth, but you do have some agency, actually. And if I think back to the 1990s during the the war in Bosnia, remember the, was it the foreign minister of Luxembourg who declared the hour of Europe, and, and of course it revealed itself as horribly embarrassing because there was no Europe to speak of to, to actually defend and make uh, for peace in the Balkans. But now it's different. And now it's three decades later. And Europe has done an enormous amount, actually, for Ukraine. And the Germans, considering where Germany started, remember 5,000 helmets, you know, that was bold, and that was, you know, high energy, a strategic contribution. But, but Germany and a number of countries have stepped up uh, so impressively. And now we get, in my view, to a critical moment where you're watching and wondering about American politics, and so are we. Uh, but, but I think it's very important for Europe to have agency to affect in any way possible the outcome of this terrible ghastly war in Ukraine. Uh, I'm on the side of the now former Finnish Prime Minister, do you remember when she was asked uh, by reporters in her home country, uh, what's the exit ramp? What's the exit ramp? And she said, the exit ramp? That's when all Russian troops leave Ukraine. They're the invading occupying forces. It seems to me, and now from a transatlantic perspective, if we're serious about things that we all talk about at all the conferences, like the UN Charter, remember that? That prohibits transborder aggression, if we're serious about it, okay? Or European security, or, or liberal international order, this is as clear a test case as we'll get. 
in our lifetime. So number one, please have agency. Don't wait for us. But then what about us? Uh, us, number two, um, John Bolton, who was one of President Trump's national security advisors, I always forget whether three or four, there were at least three that I count. He was one of the national security advisors. Uh, John Bolton has written and said in, in public and in press that um, whatever the Trump administration got right on Russia and Ukraine was against the president's instincts and a result of the National Security Advisors and Secretary Mattis and Chief of Staff General Kelly and Deputy Secretary Steve Began and Secretary Mike Pompeo. That, that strikes me as very credible and plausible. Second thing that uh, the former National Security Advisor John Bolton said publicly is during his tenure as National Security Advisor, he was convinced that the President of the United States didn't read one sentence of any memorandum ever produced for the chief executive. And then the third thing the former National Security Advisor said was in an Oval Office meeting with John Bolton and Chief of Staff John Kelly, President Trump asked whether Finland was part of Russia. So if history is a guide, and it is in some measure a guide, I'll let you draw conclusions. The third point I'd make, Daniel, which I, I think is more important, Donald Trump is important, the next president is very important, but I think is more important for us to talk about in America, and I think for many of you, most of you Europeans in the audience, I think there's something structural and cultural afoot in the United States. I think it's a pretty big deal, actually. So if you go back to 2016 and our primaries, the two candidates that excelled were Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. And people say, well, they have nothing in common. Well, they have something in common. They were the two candidates running against the establishment, against the elites, against Washington, Wall Street, and the status quo, which to me says that they were speaking to something going wrong in the heartlands, a disconnect, erosion of trust in elites. The mayor referred to this this morning, certain parts of the population that struggle with change or the ability to adapt. If you go back and look before Donald Trump, voter ties in the United States were loosening to both the Democrat and Republican Party. So something is fluid, dynamic, volatile, and I think people like Trump are both symptom and cause. Therefore, please have agency. Please don't wait for us. Please do what you can to influence our debate and please help Ukraine. It's my own view that if the end game is one more frozen conflict, that's a chance, in my view, for this Russia, this Russia in any case, to reset and start again in the future. Thank you so much, Jeff. We definitely will touch upon the question of European agency several times in, in this discussion. And, but as a European, I think we also very much hope that, uh, that bipartisan consent will be able to cap on strategic issues in, in the US as well. Um, in contrast to the first perception, GMF is a US organization and not a German one, so just as a background. And I think Germany is rightfully ridiculed for this 5,000 helmet story, but I just would like to underline that since then Germany is the second largest provider of military support to Ukraine. So I just would like to underline that the country definitely stepped up to its role uh, in this conflict as, uh, uh, as well. Um, but before we would turn to European agency, I just would like to, to ask Mr. Pepin a bit about the role of, uh, of Hungary in this regard, because certain NATO member states like Turkey or, or Hungary focus their efforts on diplomatic mediation, on peace efforts, instead of providing military aid and, and support to Ukraine. And uh, in the case of Hungary, what are the cornerstones and what are the tangible results of this peace efforts and, and mediation, for example, the Budapest Initiative for, for Peace. And the second question, whether the Hungarian government, with its rather conflict-seeking approach in the Hungarian and Ukrainian bilateral relation, isn't it undermining practically its own role as mediator 
and, and the credibility of the Hungarian peace narrative. Over to you. Thank you, Daniel. I'll try this one. Thank you so much, Daniel, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to address this crowd. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Good morning, Your Excellencies. I think that Hungary has basically played the role of a voice crying in the wilderness since the beginning of the war. And the result of that is that the Hungarian position w with regard to the war is often controversial. But typically, in my opinion, it seems that the Hungarian position is kind of accepted quietly six to eight months <coughs> later. So at the beginning of this year, when the Hungarian government was saying that now is the time uh, to have a ceasefire and that there is no military solution on the battlefield, you know, Hungary was widely criticized for this because we were, this was before the spring offensive and therefore, well, you know, Hungary is talking down the possibility of success. Well, Hungary has a very realistic approach to its analysis. Uh, and a very realistic presentation of its judgments. And again, that often causes controversy. But I think that it's pretty clear now that the situation on the battlefield is changing. We're already hearing even on this panel, the definition of victory is being, re is being redefined. And this is already happening in the American discourse. You know, early, earlier this year, um, even in my discussions with, with Americans, they, they would say, uh, well, you know, unless you support the, the, the in, unless you think it's likely that Ukraine will completely recapture all of its territory, you know, nothing short of that is victory. Well, we're already hearing that begin to be redefined because people are beginning to realize that there isn't a military solution on the battlefield. Or if there is in some theoretical space, there's not in a practical space. The US is not in it to win it. They are not going to, they are not going to invade. They are not going to come. There's a severe division in US society that we do not, the US does not have a united foreign policy. You know, most of the US's foreign policy for the last 20 years has resulted in this kind of um, well, maybe not frozen conflict, but you know, uh, situations in which victory has been steadily redefined. You know, think Iraq, think Afghanistan, uh, and that that seriously eroded the credibility of U.S. foreign policy, even for U.S. citizens. So it's not just that. Um, you know, with all due respect to my to my fellow American on the panel, it's not just that. You know, American. Americans who voted for Trump were unable to adapt or unable to change, you know, to adjust to changing circumstances. They were basically sold out by their elites. They lost all of their industries, and then they sent their children to die in basically pointless wars. So that's the that's the circumstances on the American side, and that's why currently I think 55% of Americans don't want further uh, military support for Ukraine. That's why military support for Ukraine actually suffered in the most recent continuing resolution that came out of the, the congressional negotiations. So, you know, talk is cheap. It's easy to talk about uh, the imperative of, you know, total victory on the battlefield, the imperative of regime change or whatever. And, and, and I think Europeans, when, when, when it's felt that America is, uh, is fully supportive from behind, it's easy to say that. And, it's pretty clear now that things are, are not going to go in that direction. Like the, the most predictable uh, shift in the prosecution of the war, the single most predictable event was that in fall of this year, America would turn more inward and start focusing on the election. Like obviously, like everyone, everyone knew that was coming. Um, and, and, and the result of that is that Europe will be left holding the bag. We can, again, it talk is cheap, it's easy to talk about European reindustrialization, which would be required for supporting its own, for, for supporting our own militaries. But, you know, you can't reindustrialize if you're going through deindustrialization due to cheap, due to lack of cheap energy. So, you know, there, in, in politics, there are always uh, conflicting goals and you have to select one of them and prioritize accordingly. But we can't, you know, decouple the world and maintain access to cheap energy in Europe. It's not happening. Even America, which has access to you know, much cheaper energy overall in its own uh, natural, natural resources, even America has been suffering the decline of its military stocks, the difficulty of maintaining the industrial production, its artillery production is you know, pathetic, and so on and so forth. There are all these bizarre bottlenecks that have, that have come up. So I agree it, with the overall point 
that the, that the terrible Russian invasion of Ukraine and all the consequences of it are a huge wake-up call. They are a huge wake-up call. There should be European uh, reindustrialization. There should be strong European defense. But the situation on the battlefield, I think people are beginning to realize it is roughly what Hungary has been saying for a while. And I think our contribution to peace shouldn't be interpreted as uh, conflictual with Ukraine or not providing enough rhetorical support. I mean, you know, uh, wars are not won through rhetoric. They're actually won on the battlefield. Um, and so I think Hungary's contribution is to be ahead of its time on this, on this imperative. And uh, we're already seeing the victory being redefined within the West, but we have a simple definition of, of peace, which is immediate ceasefire. Thank you so much, Mr. Pepin, for, for your insights. Um, I think the, the Hungarian assessment of the situation was over the past 20 months that a Russian victory is inevitable, but Ukraine is, is still standing uh, in that regard. Uh, but we will see in, in which direction, in military sense, this, this conflict will, will end. I fully agree uh, on your assessment uh, regarding the necessity of European reindustrialization. Aside of the lack of cheap energy, I potentially would add the lack of workforce uh, as one of the, the further limits on, on European uh, industrialization. But I think the question of, uh, of European agency was several times touched upon. And, and I would like to, to ask you, Mr. Mr. Lunak, that I think nearly all European stakeholders remember the words of, of Donald Trump and his public contemplation about the US abandoning NATO if European allies don't pool and don't provide their fair share uh, to the joint burden sharing of the organization. And uh, just as it was asked, uh, how can European NATO allies uphold crucial support to Ukraine, potentially against the background of a reluctant next US administration? How can Europe make support to Ukraine Trump-proof? Mm -hmm. Over to you. Well, many thanks. Many thanks for the floor. Many thanks for the invitation. I will uh, make uh, three points. And in fact, I will start with commenting on what uh, Mr. Jed uh, Gedmin said and Reka, you know, in, in, in many ways. Well, first of all, the question was what is, um, you know, uh, how to make sure you ask the question about Russia's defeat. Russia has been defeated. You know, strategically, Russia failed to deliver to achieve its goals, which uh, the goals of its, of its aggression. In fact, now the, the question really is to ensure Ukraine's victory, which is not necessarily, which is not necessarily the, 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 the same thing. Um, I will, I'll make three points. First, um, on, on, on the, you know, there is no point in denying or being in denial or belittling um, challenges that may come with any political change in, uh, in, in any member, uh, member country of, of NATO. But uh, again, you know, let's at the first uh, Trump, uh, Trump administration, in fact, you know, uh, there was a lot of rhetoric uh, uh, in the in in the, uh, in the election campaign. But if you actually look at what the Trump administration, and I'm not saying that it's going to happen again, but you know, it's the only evidence we have. In fact, um, you know, there were not so many um, sort of, or there was more continuity with, the, with what, what was uh, in place than, than many feared and, and predicted. In fact, you know, um, uh, the Trump administration uh, increased the, uh, the budget uh, for defense uh, of Europe. It did not derail any of the ongoing initiatives of the, such, such as the European um, Reassurance Initiative or European Deterrence uh, Initiative. In fact, uh, you, know, you know, U.S. Congress has been taking measures since, uh, since 2016 to uh, make it impossible for any U.S. administration uh, to withdraw from NATO. You know, and in fact, if I understand it correctly, that, that proviso, again, is part of the uh, 2024 uh, spending, uh, spending bill. So, you know, I, I, think, uh, I think we should took, uh, take a look at, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the evidence. My second point is is that um, you know I don't think that we can sort of conclude that the U.S. public is isolationist. In fact, if you look at the uh, if you look at the raft of uh, of um 
public opinion polls, um, you know, it it actually shows a more nuanced and uh, I would say a positive picture of uh, U.S. support than some doom and gloom narratives would would suggest. Uh, for example, uh, you know, in June and July, nearly half of Americans wanted Congress to spend more money on Ukraine. Uh, Seventy-six percent of Americans saw Ukraine victory over Russia as important to the United States. So, you know, I think I think we should take into consideration also uh, also uh, that uh, that uh, reality. Um, uh, there's no point in denying that, in fact, among the Republican voters, the, the support for, for Ukraine is lower than, than among Democrats, but it's still not, uh, you know, it's, it's still, uh, the, 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 the support is uh, pretty much uh, balanced. Overall, 61% of, uh, of, of, of the Americans actually support Ukraine's membership in NATO. Yeah? Again, lower support amongst, amongst uh, Republicans, but in fact 61% 61 of the Americans, according to the, uh, to the um, uh, transatlantic trends recently published by, uh, by the GMF, support, uh, support Ukraine's, uh, Ukraine's membership in NATO, which brings me to my third point. In fact, and that was the gist of your question, what should, what, uh, should we do as far as Ukraine is concerned, I think we have to sort of continue delivering on, on, on the future of strategic future for Ukraine. You know, we, uh, at, the, at the Vilnius summit, we uh, took some important uh, steps. We said very clearly, all allies, you know, 31 allies, we are 31 um, like-minded, but not necessarily same-minded democracies, but all of us agreed that Ukraine's rightful place is in NATO. You know, we actually uh, removed one hurdle, which was membership action plan, from the, from the road of, uh, on, 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 on NATO. So we have to make sure that we actually continue collectively delivering on that on that particular on that uh, particular uh, uh, promise and and vision for uh, for Ukraine in addition of course to continued military support military and civilian support for uh, for Ukraine for NATO it's been uh, and, you know for my organization it's been it's been quite uh, remarkable the uh, although you know we uh, NATO as an organization provides so non lethal uh, military military aid uh, lethal aid is provided by individual allies but still you know uh, it's quite unprecedented in, in NATO context that we committed 500 million dollars actually, you know, to, to, to Ukraine non-lethal non uh, assistance, which compared to what we were contributing before the, uh, the, con uh, before the conflict, which was in the order of two or three million, is quite, is quite remarkable. But again, the burden is mainly on, on, individual, on individual NATO allies. So that would be my three, my three points. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mr. Lunak. If you allow me uh, just an immediate follow-up question. I think if there is one widespread and general pattern of European uh, way of thinking, and it is the constant underestimation of our own strength, unity, and, and determination. And obviously it was fantastic to see how European NATO member states and, and EU members rallied around the flag after February 2022. Nonetheless, now we can also see the limits of that unity uh, and, and determination. We see the Turkish-Hungarian blockade to Sweden's NATO accession. We see the reluctance of Turkey to allow a more robust NATO naval presence in the Black Sea, even if that would be in compliance with the letter of the Montreux Convention. We see the Polish-Slovak-Hungarian blockade of Ukrainian grain export and its repercussions on Polish military support to Ukraine. So we see the limits of that unity. Mm -hmm. How should NATO address and this challenge and restore unity in all of these strategic issues? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, let me say a few words about how this unity actually emerged. And I think, uh, you know, around, around Ukraine, which uh, frankly, if you look at the, the sort of uh, the, the, the evolution and development since the beginning, it's quite remarkable because at the beginning of the conflict, allies were talking about uh, not, uh, not uh, letting, you know, Ukraine lose, punishing Russia and so forth. Now we are actually committed to Ukraine's victory. It's not up to us to, to define what Ukraine's victory means. It's actually up to, up to Ukraine uh, and Ukraine alone to, 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 to define that. But I think there are three reasons for, 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 that, uh, for that unity. First, remarkable resistance uh, of, of Ukraine as a country, as a state, and as a society. 
you know, uh, which which many doubted in 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 in, in the West. Let's let's be let's be frank about it. Uh, uh, second, um, I think uh, you know we as as uh, as the the Western or sort of NATO community, we uh, and not only NATO by the uh, by the way the EU as well, we tied our geopolitical status to to success of of of, of Ukraine. By the way, Ukraine is actually a candidate country, uh, you know, not only for for NATO but also for the European for the European Union, you know, a failure, a failure to deliver uh, uh, on on that on that vision would be a failure for well for Ukraine, but not only for Ukraine, but also for all of us. So I think we have to we have to take that into into uh, consideration. Um, a second point, unity. Uh, you mentioned uh, you mentioned um, you know the continuing. Um, Discussion about Swedish membership. Well, we have a. It's not been easy, but again, you know, uh, Finland is part of uh, part of NATO. Um, uh, Sweden will hopefully be uh, part of uh, part of NATO soon. We have uh, we have the sort of commitment of on, on the part of President Erdogan to put it on the agenda of the of the Parliament. We have the Hungarian statement that Hungary will not be the the last country to actually to 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 uh, to approve to ratify uh, Swedish uh, Swedish membership. So this is. Hopefully, uh, going to happen in the in, in the next in the next few uh, in the next few uh, months. And again, you know, if you look at what how this uh, this entire conflict started, you know, Mr. Putin, when he started this this whole campaign, uh, wanted less NATO. He uh, in 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 December 2021, uh, two months before the conflict uh, broke out, he sent us uh, and the you know uh, to the uh, member countries and to us to NATO a proposal which was basically mean a rollback uh, to 1997, you know, withdrawal from from Allied troops from from where they were, you know, up to 1997, uh, you know, a uh, commitment that uh, that Ukraine would not become a member a member of NATO. If you look at the situation now, uh, we he actually got, he ended up with having more NATO. Uh, Finland is part of NATO, Sweden will hopefully join, uh, join uh, soon. There's a clear vision for, uh, for Ukraine uh, to, uh, to join. So I think it's again, you know, a complete strategic failure on, on his part. But what, but finally to your question as to, as to what we should do well, I think, you know, um, we should collectively as European also deliver on our promises and put our money where our mouth is, you know. And uh, uh, again, uh, sorry for harping on, on on defense budgets because this has been this has been um, an ongoing discussion in, in NATO uh, for, for many years, also almost two decades. In 2006, um, member countries, actually ally, uh, allies, you know, agreed to spend uh, to, to aim for spending at, uh, at least two percent of, of GDP on, on defense. Well, uh, in 2014. There was a solemn commitment to actually do that by 2024. Well, we are in 2023, um, uh, and only 11 uh, uh, member countries actually do uh, do honour that uh, that uh, commitment. That is not to say that nothing has been done. On the contrary, a lot of money, a lot of money has been put into Allied defence. But you know, it needs. Uh, we need to do. We need to do more. Uh, uh, just going back to to sort of strategic agency that that Mr. Germen and Reka uh, mentioned. I think this is this is where it all should uh, should start. Thank you so much. I really like your phrase, and I hope I quote it correctly, that we tied our geopolitical future to the success of Ukraine. I think there could be no better summary what's at stake for us in this conflict in, uh, in, in Europe. Uh, Rika, if you allow me just once again come back to the role of, uh, of Hungary. Uh, over the past two years, or slowly two years, uh, actions of the Hungarian governments have been frequently perceived and interpreted by key allies as ones which are serving or promoting Russian strategic interest in this conflict. And uh, I think all those who are following Hungarian politics are not even surprised by occasions when Prime Minister Orban or Foreign Minister Sijarto practically regularly burst out against the the Western alliance system. But in parallel to that, uh, Hungarian President Katalin Novak usually takes a much more reassuring and reconciliatory tone, especially to Ukraine. And my question is, do we see here a real conflict between the foreign policy approach of the Hungarian president and, uh, and the foreign policy strategy of the Hungarian government? 
or this perceived difference or conflict is practically just part of a coordinated good cop, bad cop game in which the task of President Katalin Novak is to address the concerns of, uh, of Western partners and, and try to somehow uh, mitigate them. Over to you. Thank you. Oh, I think it's um, the question of the bilateral relations between uh, Hungary and Ukraine um, are of strategic importance. And in this, Hungary has multiple interests. Um, just to uh, name a few, you know, just off the um, top of my head. Obviously, the situation of the uh, Hungarian minority in Ukraine has been clearly uh, put on the table. Another key interest, though, in the longer term is the interconnectivity of the two countries, uh, primarily in the natural gas uh, system. Either way the gas flows, it will have natural, uh, I mean, uh, strategic consequences. Third one is the transit potential between Europe and Ukraine. Uh, we could see it in the grain uh, crisis, but I think we have a, a whole list of other items that we could explore uh, um, beneficially for both countries. Um, fourth one, obviously, is the stability and the sovereignty of, of a neighbor, because it has immediate security consequences for, for Hungary. Um, a fifth one is the strategic possibility um, uh, of Ukraine getting closer to EU and NATO. And, uh, of course, um, that will have an impact immediately on Hungary's position as the kind of the periphery of these organizations that will change fundamentally and for good. And maybe a last one, or whatever, six, but I think we could have some other ideas as well. But Hungary's interest in, in regional uh, relations and in regional interconnectivity. Uh, we have seen in the Three Seas Initiative concept, you know, that um, that is a huge potential of, uh, of uh, infrastructure development uh, in, in many ways in the region. And it's not all the same for Hungary, you know, how these are going to be developed. Vis a vis, you know, Ukraine belonging to the Central European region and creating a wholly new Central Europe um, by itself. So, um, out of these, you know, whatever, six um, competing interests, we might say, uh, what we can see now, I think, is an effort uh, of developing a combination or a uh, 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 of, of these uh, not just parallel interests, uh, not just competing interests, but also. Um, um, kind of long-term interests. Uh, if we take a look at this relationship in the longer term, it ha we have to be aware of the fact that there are some hard facts that will stay there. Ukraine will remain a neighbor of Hungary, for sure, for a long term. In Ukraine, Kiev is going to remain in charge of decision-making uh, about the future of the country. Uh, the Ukrainian-Russian relations will remain tense and strained for a long time, um, hundred years at least, you know, just imagine you know, the current, the children of those who are killed and, and the children whose homes have been destroyed by, you know, Russian soldiers and the Russian military action will have to talk with the children of those who killed their fathers and who destroyed their homes. So we will have a generational impact of this uh, uh, conflict for a long time, even if there is a fundamental political change in Russia that will not go away without, uh, you know, uh, overnight. Um, and uh, a, third, a fourth very important element is that Ukraine's relations with the West will remain very important, both for the EU and for the US. So I think all of this kind of show into the direction that, okay, of all of these priorities, uh, competing priorities that Hungary has with Ukraine, um, and the fact that Hungary prioritized the uh, issue of the national minorities and the situation of the national minorities, is something that will have to be taken seriously by Ukraine. And at the same time as Hungary will have to take seriously um, the priorities and concerns of Ukraine. Um, I believe that it's very clear that if that is the priority, there is place for criticism and concern on the Hungarian side. The question is the time for this criticism and the manner of this criticism or the style of this criticism. So I think in the first step, uh, what would be very important is to start a more uh, systematically cooperative language in the bilateral relationship. I think it would do a lot more good for both countries, uh, and it would take uh, both countries much farther away in achieving their goals. 
Uh, and I also believe that if we look back, you know, five years down the road to this current uh, situation, both of these countries, both Ukraine and Hungary, will regret the emphasis on, on uh, uh, confrontation and conflict in, in the narratives that, we, uh, that, is, that is being used. So I believe that that kind of a, a combination of the various uh, interests, uh, in addition to a, a focus of the uh, uh, a cooperative language, should be the uh, priority uh, of the next uh, couple of months and years. And I believe that this is what is being forged, uh, hopefully, uh, in, in these uh, past months as well. It, that it's, without, it's not without ups and downs is clear. Apparently, it's not an easy thing to combine these competing interests. Uh, very clearly, it's um, going to forge a long-term relationship in a kind of a solid basis, because all of these elements are long-term and all of these elements are fundamentally defining the relationship between the two countries. And I believe that this is what the two countries' interests are, to develop this stronger ties uh, with, you know, through, uh, go through the uh, conflictual issues as well. Thank you so much, Rika, for your measured uh, words. And I seriously hope that your recommendation about uh, cooperative language will also find its way to the, to the Hungarian stakeholders and, and decision makers. Being mindful of time and in order that also our, uh, our great audience has the opportunity to ask some questions, if you allow me, I would ask, address your last question practically to, to both of you. And it would be that over the past 20 months, one of the most fashionable narrative, at least in this corner of the world, was the shift of the European center of gravity, especially the center of gravity of NATO, to the east. And my question is, how sustainable is this shift? And, uh, and how structural, whether it only relates to agenda setting power and, and shaping European perceptions, or does it really have material fundaments in capabilities and, and power resources and their distribution among, uh, among EU and, uh, and NATO member states? Uh, what role can Central Europe, Central European EU and NATO members play in the future in influencing strategic decisions at EU and NATO level. Mr. Pepin. Thank you so much, and it's a, it's a great question to end on, or at least end this portion of the discussion on. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about, about this and uh, since, the be since the beginning of the war that, um, and I think it boils down to an, an analysis of what the US is trying to do. Uh, and whether the U.S. is intending to shift the shift the locus of its uh, of its energy and weight from uh, from you know Western Central Europe to Eastern Central Europe and to Eastern Europe. Um, but I think the 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 question there boils down to what the U.S. will do it kind of geopolitically as a whole. The answer to the question of whether Eastern Europe will be the new power center depends in a large part on whether the U.S. will continue to make Europe, as it has been for the last year and a half, uh, the focus of its energies, or whether the election campaign and a, a potential change of administration in the U.S. would draw American attention more toward Asia. And if the latter happens, then it's, it becomes a kind of theoretical question overall. Um, so I think that we have to, as, uh, as European actors, be fully aware of this overall situation. A lot has changed in the global political order in the last year and a half. The different elements of it ha that, that used to be united under American power, economic power, military power, cultural influence, have all begun to kind of pull apart. And many of the, as I said earlier, many of the military predictions about the course of the war seem not to have been realized in the way that, in the way that we expected. Uh, so the question is what will happen to the, the global order as a whole. Already many of the actions that the, that the West has taken have actually undermined its own position. This is true with respect to our access to cheap energy has gone away. That's obviously hurt us. And even with respect to the, how we've kind of weaponized the global financial system, you know, trying to remove, uh, re remove Russia from the SWIFT system was one of the earliest things. And it turns out that a, 
it turns out if we just need to step outside of Europe for a moment to realize that a lot of the a lot of the rest of the world um, is beginning to to take a very different view of the of the nature of Western power and and how it's projected. So. Uh, I would very much like to see uh, a, 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 a strong and influential Central Europe. I think it's not simply a question of the, it shouldn't simply be a question of the locus of American military power. Central Europe is a place where there's a different vision of what Europe can be, a Europe of nations, a Europe with strong cultural traditions, and a Europe that remains open to economic cooperation uh, with all parties. This is an area where a strong block formation between West and East would not lead to stronger economic benefits for Eastern Europe. And I think many of the parties know that. So to get back to, 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 get back to your question, clearly there's been a lot of talk um, about the new locus of power in Eastern Europe. Clearly some Eastern Euro European capitals have been uh, counting on that and, and kind of placing a bet on it. But the elephant in the room is always where America's attention goes next. And in order to have our own proper influence within Europe, I think we need to rely most of all on our own traditions and vision of what European power should be. Thank you so much, Mr. Pepin. Jeff, the same question. How real, how sustainable is the eastern shift of Europe's center of gravity? Uh, D Daniel, thank you. I, I do believe it, it depends in part on the outcome of the Ukraine war. And, and one can get a little bit of the feeling in this hall that, that Ukraine is winning and we just have this untidy business. There's a little scrappy fighting in the east, but, but Ukraine has won. Um, can I ask the audience, raise your hand if you come from Ukraine? One, two, three, four hands. Okay. So you can speak, or in the coffee break you can tell us, uh, but uh, I've been to Ukraine since the war, as many of you probably have. Uh, I'm running in the acting presidency, RFERL. We have over 100 reporters and producers and editors in Prague and Lviv and Kiev and across the East. Very hard, but really very hard to find Ukrainians who think this is going well and they've won or, or they're winning. And I'm going to tell you, I just talked to a British journalist friend of mine who is in a village in western Ukraine where all the peace is, you know, so peaceful, it's so stable. He said, in this village in western Ukraine, it's almost all women, except for some elderly men and young men missing arms and legs. This can't be what victory and peace with security looks like. So I'm going to I'm going to answer your I'm going to respond to your point, but I, I, I indulge me. I make the following because I think it helps frame the shift of gravity, the future of Europe, vibrancy of European security. Number one, whatever the peace process is or the ceasefire is, I strongly believe that's for Ukrainians to decide. Their country, their fight, their future and they have elected government. Second of all, the President of the United States, President Biden, said from the outset, no American troops on the ground and no American pilots in the sky. Not unreasonable, and that's what the market was going to bear politically. But what we didn't do while saying we will help as long as it takes, we never said what it is. For however long it takes, what is it? And we never gave the Ukrainians what they needed to win long-range missiles, the necessary tanks, and air powers. If you look at the top American generals like retired General Breedloff and retired General Hodges, very well known in Europe, they say we would never send our American men and women into battle like that, ever. Into these densely knit minefields without air power, the long-range missiles, and the requisite tanks. So, pivot, okay. I believe that if, it's, you call it rhetoric if you will, but I'm following the Ukrainian lead. They actually want their country back. You know? And for those who say they don't need it all back, if someone says that in Paris, I would say you go first. Give up part of Provence as a goodwill gesture of sign of peace and dialogue for the next peace summit. I just don't think it's ethical, moral, politically sound, or strategically wise for us across the West to start giving up parts of Ukraine in the name of peace. And I don't believe it'll be peace with security. And Daniel, we didn't talk about China, but it was referred to. I think China watches this very, very carefully. And I don't think China cares about Ukraine. 
and I don't think China cares about Russia. I think China cares about whether we have the will to help Ukraine prevail and we have an attention span more than five minutes. That's that. So on the shift of gravity, um, there is some shift of gravity, but the mantra that gets repeated I don't think captures the full reality. So we know Poland has stepped up and is building its land forces, and there, there is some strategic shift of gravity in the East. A, it depends on the outcome of the war in Ukraine. I do believe whether it's sustainable, and B, uh, look at Europe as you do, you're more expert than I in a more differ differentiated way. In parts of Central and Eastern Europe you see fragmentation. Look at the elections in Slovakia, uh, look at pro-Russian sympathies in Bratislava, I will say Budapest, I just said the word, and then Romania, how complicated, supports Ukraine, but not so much publicly because they're conflicted internally, and then we can go down through Bulgaria and Serbia and Greece, NATO member. Part of Europe is rather fragmented and conflicted and peace at any price, let's say, for you Ukrainians. The, the other part of Europe, Poland, Czech Republic, the Balts, the Nordics, what, what emerges is, a, I would call it, a common operating picture, you know, threat perception or strategic culture. And, and there you have a, a sense and a spirit and language that doesn't exist in other parts of Europe, and maybe not even in the United States. So I started by quoting the ex-Finnish Prime Minister. I'll close by quoting the Estonian Prime Minister, do you remember before the Munich Security, at the Munich Security Conference, right before this invasion, remember not the first invasion, this invasion of Russia, of Ukraine, the Estonian Prime Minister, it was brilliant, it's on YouTube, it's about 60 seconds, it resonates in the Baltics, it resonates in the Nordics, it resonates in Poland, it resonates in the Czech Republic, other parts of Europe, not so much. She said, before the, this invasion, she said, uh, here's how the Kremlin negotiates. So generalizing, but there we are. She said, first what Russia does is demands what, it, what doesn't belong to it, okay? And then when that's challenged, it threatens to escalate. And then when it gets the peace negotiations, it insists on getting more than they had in the first place. Not a bad formulation. Thank you so much, Jeff, for this uh, sobering analysis. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you all for your insights. I think you provided us a lot of food for thought. I am aware of the time, but I think it would be fair to allow the audience to ask at least two short questions. And I really ask you to provide two, two short replies. So ladies and gentlemen, you have the floor. Please raise your hands. Our colleagues will, uh, will provide you the, the micro. Uh, any questions? There a question back in the, in the rows? And potentially we can take also a second one together. Can you hear me? Great. Yep. Thanks. My name is Ben Novak. Um, my question is for Gladden Papin. I don't know, are we allowed to consider you a representative of the Hungarian government? No. Okay. So just working for an institute affiliated with the Hungarian government. I understand a lot of the, the rationale uh, behind the, the statements you make and one thing that is perplexes me, and, I, and, I, and I'd love to know the answer to this. How do you square that reasoning with the conspiracy theories and the hate mongering generated by this government's propaganda apparatus against Ukraine, a nation that Vladimir Putin has launched a genocidal war of aggression against? Thank you, Ben, for the question. And a second question, Peter. Thank you, and uh, sorry, don't, I, it will be just a short, short question. So there are many discussions these days that the <coughs> Middle East conflict will suck away a lot of attention, resources, and probably popular support from uh, Ukraine and supporting Ukraine. So what's your take on that? Thanks, Peter. Mr. Pepin? Uh, thank you, Ben. I, I guess I don't fully understand the direction of the question, but um, you know, certainly the, the the media environment in the United States is uh, more than a little bit toxic right now. So I'm not really sure what the what the comparison. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not. I'm I'm not really sure what the 
what the direction of the of the question is, but from a but from a serious foreign policy standpoint, you know, Hungary stands for its own national sovereignty and interests, and so you know those those primarily include peace. So what Hungary wants is to have a, a quick and uh, a quick end to as quick an end to the war as possible. And I'm sure that in I'm sure that in every media environment there are a lot of provocative communications. So, you know, it's a it's a it's an interesting theoretical question. But you know, on on a on a on a practical level, you know, media debate is always intense and and includes a lot of characterizations on both sides. So you know, I, I, that's 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 the nature of it. And uh, unfortunately, you know, the reality is that the conflict won't be solved through memes on either side. It seemed like. Uh, you know, there were a lot of arguments at the beginning of the war, like, you know, the the West is winning the information war and stuff like that, and uh, and um, you know, the West put out a, a a number of of similarly provocative accounts. You know, it's something that happens during war, so I I don't I don't really find it a, a strange or or frankly interesting phenomenon. So I, I'm afraid I don't I don't then understand the thrust of the question. Thanks. Uh, I think the blockade of the European Defence Facility or the blockade to the raising of the European budget ceiling in order to undercut support to Ukraine is a bit more tangible policy position than, uh, than just uh, narrative and provocative language. But I think we can continue this discussion uh, by a coffee in the break. Uh, Mr. Lunak, I think as a NATO representative, you are the best position to, to answer the second question. Mm. Please go no. ahead. No, very good, uh, very good and pertinent uh, question. Um, look, you know, I think uh, uh, there's been a... Uh, <laughs> There is no question that the international order as we knew it, uh, the post-Cold War, whatever, illiberal international order is under attack, uh, you know, serious attack. And whatever, uh, w uh, you know, but there should be one lesson that we all learn, that everything is, uh, is linked with everything else. For example, I would argue that, you know, because there is a lot of talk and actually reality, uh, U.S. pivoting to Asia, you know, they, uh, uh, but I would actually argue that uh, that uh, uh, Ukraine's victory, Ukraine's victory in, in in the war is very much linked with the future, uh, with the with the with the success of sort of managing the what we call in in NATO's in NATO's language uh, China's uh, China's challenge. You know, if in fact. Um, uh, I think it's in, in the in the in the interests of, 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 of all allies, but in particular of the United States, to make sure uh, that Ukraine wins and make which will actually make it easier to deal with uh, deal with China. You know, uh, Mr. Xi is very very closely uh, watching um, what is what is happening in, in in Europe. If Ukraine if Ukraine prevails, as we all hope and will do everything possible for that, uh, I think he will he will uh, draw a very Different, uh, very different lesson than than uh, would have been the you know the case uh, if if uh, if the result, the outcome of the crisis is different. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Rico, Jeff, Mr. Lunak, Mr. Pepin. Thank you so much for this very insightful, even if from time to time a bit controversial discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, being with us. Uh, enjoy your coffee and uh, see you around in the next panel after the break and i think it will be soon announced when the break will end thank you so much thank you <laughs>